Thank you, David. Thank you, Christina. That kind of tranquilized my nerves a little bit. Um, if you guys thought we were going to do a Christmas sermon, you're wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan, for those words earlier. That was very to the point. Um, and if you're visiting, I want to welcome you and let you know that if you came to see a good preacher, you might be wrong too. So <laughs> I ask God's blessing, and we are going to hope on that. We're going to trust in that, and we're going to move forward. Um, there's two things that I fear. One is that clock over there, and the other one is uh, the needles. I do not like needles. I admire what the... What the uh, nurses and doctors from the church do. Um, that's not one of my things. Um, when I was in high school, once we had a lab, and we went downstairs and we took our backpacks downstairs, and we were going to extract blood out of each other and then see what type of blood we were. Um, you had to you know, do your own thing and uh, poke your own yourself, and then we had to. I had to kind of milk my finger. Well, I started feeling kind of bad. My mouth dried completely. I was. I had a little bottle. I drank it all, and I was thirsty. Then um, I started feeling kind of numb. I started feeling really weird. I couldn't see. And this girl was in front of her, in front of me. I still remember her name. Her name was Elizabeth. She was skinny, very skinny. And I said, Ellie, um, can you take me outside? I'm not feeling well. And she looked up and she looks at me and she says, Daniel, what's wrong with you? You're pale. I could see the wall behind you. So I grab her from the shoulders because I, I can't see a thing. I don't know why I couldn't see, but I can't see a thing. As I'm walking outside, luckily we had gone down with our backpacks, but they were on the side of the wall. I just went bang. <laughs> I didn't make it outside. Later I woke up. I, I went outside, and I was just sitting there, and I remember the teacher went out and said, you better feel good. If not, I'm going to give you an injection. I said, oh, no, don't worry about it. I'll be fine. <laughs> Um, we are going to study this morning on somebody that his knees were going one against the other. He was a very nervous situation for him. I could almost assure you that he was more nervous than I was and more nervous than what I am now. His name was Belshazzar. Um, he had defied God, right? He, uh, most of you guys know the story. Um, he had defied God, and God had come to judge him. Um, great changes were taking place at that time. Great changes. Similar to now, how many changes do we have nowadays in politics and around the world? All kinds of changes. It seems to, they say, like, his, uh, well, the news, sometimes they, see, uh, they, they come with uh, some um, things that they say, like, we are better off than, you know, medieval times, right? And in, in much fields, we might be much better, right? But in other fields... We are not as great. I was going through the other day on slavery. It says that there hasn't been that much uh, slaves as there were in, back in the history. Today, there's more slaves than ever before, and I was amazed with that. Um, according, you know, you could, you could find a better definition for, for slaves, but I was amazed um, that there's a lot more slaves than there is before. Um, Belshazzar had had many opportunities to know God, right? His, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he had known God. There's even a chapter written by Nebuchadnezzar, right? It's the only chapter written by somebody who was not part of, 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 the, of, the, of God, right? He was a king, a king of a nation, 
that was not Israel's nation, and he wrote a chapter in the Bible. And you could uh, read it in Daniel chapter 4. Belshazzar has had all these opportunities, but he allowed the love of pressure, pleasure and self-glorification to efface the lessons. He wasted those opportunities. Graciously granted to him in his pride and arrogancy with a reckless feeling of security, Belshazzar had made a great feast. So the, the city was surrounded. It was being attacked. His army was far away in a, dis, in a distant country fighting another a battle. He felt secure. He felt he was okay. He had the city, it had big walls, and he would say it was impenetrable. Um, there was a river, right, that went through. They say that uh, they had enough food up to 10 years. Um, and they had a river where they could pull fresh water. They had no need for, for uh, water or problems with rain or anything. They had a river. But what happened? The Medes took the river out into a different path, and then they went in through the river, right? Wealth, power, beautiful women, men of genius and education were there. Everybody was there. What happened? They brought the vessels from uh, the vessels from the temple to drink in them, right? The king, his lords were having pleasure. Meanwhile, there was unseen watcher among them. There was somebody in there that was not invited, but was there is here and has been everywhere since, right? How many people out there doing the same thing, seeking pleasure, looking for pleasure, doing pleasure, while their actions are being recorded, are being seen, are being watched? Uh, they will have to... Be, they will be judged and they will be uh, asked for their actions. Not their, not the, maybe not the holy cups or plates, but their ho holy bodies, right? Now, um, nowadays, we feel like we could have a fortress, right? We could have money. We could have health. We could go to the gym every day. We could um, have a family. We, we could feel safe in work. We could feel safe maybe having a couple weapons at home. Or a country could feel very safe because it has all kinds of weapons, modern weapons that nobody else has. Right? But God will judge. And when God judges, there's not getting away. Um, nothing will work. How foolish is, is our, our nature, right, to think that we, we, we are safe without God, that we could rely on our health, our weapons, our, our money, our anything. God will judge. After the, the, the party was going, there's an unbodied hand that came by. We all know the story. The joints of his hips became loose and his knees hit against each other. Isn't that amazing? How many seconds ago was he partying? And he was giving honor to the gods of brass and gold and silver and... All kinds of stuff, right? How many seconds did that happen? And then everything went away. Everybody was silent. Nobody could hear. And, well, sorry, 
No, everybody went silent, and you could hear any little noise. Just a hand in the, in the wall writing. Isn't that amazing? Everybody went silent. Everybody who was drunk was not drunk after that, I could assure you. Just imagine if we were there, the chills in your body, the chills through your spine, the, 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 the goosebumps that you get, right? Have you ever been scared at something? I remember my dad when I was, when I was young, we had horses and um, we had him at the house and then we have um, fields and then there was a warehouse there and once in a while my dad said, oh, the food of the horse is almost over. You need to bring some from the warehouse. Go over there and bring some. And I would go over there. We had a lot of occupations. And I would come back and I forget it. And it was night already. And my dad would say, well, you have to go get it. You can't leave the horses without food. So I would grab a little pocket knife that I had, pull it out, unfold it, put it in my pocket, and walk all, all the way over there. And I remember it was dark. You know, I had a flashlight. But any little noise, I would turn around and grab my little knife on my on my on my pocket. Um, I do remember those chills on my spine, you know, all the goosebumps. You feel like your hairs in the back kind of stand, but they don't actually stand. Can you imagine being there at that moment? How would that feel? What feelings would he have? His conscience would be awakened. Obviously, he had a conscience. He had a little bit of it left because when that hand came out, he knew he was doing wrong. If he would have been doing right, he would have been nervous. He knew he was doing wrong. I remember as a kid, we were playing in the, in the plaza and all of a sudden, we saw a huge light, bright, really bright, and when I turned around and I saw that big light, I said, it's the second coming, you know? And you get this feeling, like it's like your body like responds right away with fear. It turned out it was just a dove that had a ring on, its, on, the, on the foot and it made contact in between the cables or, or grounded one of the cables and it made the huge light. But when, when you feel that, Believe me, it just, your body responds really fast. When uh, Patrick, no, sorry, Prophets and Kings says, when God makes men fear, they cannot hide the intensity of their terror. Um, they could not find somebody who could trans or, or read that scripture. And my, one of my favorite parts of, of this verse, of this story, is when the, the queen comes in, right? Remember the story? The queen comes in and says, I know somebody. And she says a word, I know a man. That's my favorite part of it. I know a man. Who was it? Daniel. It was Daniel. His best name ever. Um, if we, we, if we, we can go, if, if you want to open your Bibles to Samuel, 1 Samuel, sixteen, sorry, 17, 16, I'm sorry, 16. Verse 17, 16, 17. There was a man named David, and it was a man according to God's heart. And the prophet Samuel did a really good job on writing his characteristics. His character. And it's amazing to me how he describes him. 
Um, at that moment, Saul was having a bad moment, a bad season, because he hadn't done the, stu- the right stuff. So he was feeling guilty. And whenever that guilt came, he could not find rest. So they found a man, and it says, In verse 17, so Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Uh, He was looking for somebody that could play for him the harp. Meanwhile, he felt guilty in that playing would take away the guilt or, or would give him this relaxation. Then one of the servants answered, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse of the Bethlehem, who is skilled in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Amen? So he was, first, he played well, right? He had skills, and he played well. So he did stuff well. He did stuff right. Uh, Second, he's a mighty man of valor. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a a man of war. We are in a war, aren't we? Nathan was reading my mind when he was up here, and we didn't speak yesterday. He texted me, but we didn't speak. And he was reading in my mind, we are in a war. And it's evil and good in our minds and everybody's bodies. Prudent in his speech. And a handsome person. And the Lord is with him. The most important one. The Lord is with him. Amen? Amen. Uh, there's a second verse that I would like to, you to read. It's in Chronicles, First Chronicles 12. He was a man of war. I want to describe this in a different verse. Uh, Chronicles 12, 30. Two. Let's start in 31. They were coming to crown David. And um, they were, they were uh, joining forces, all the tribes. And they were all putting out this huge number of men for war. And from, the, from half the tribe of uh, Manasseh, 18,000 who were designed by, uh, sorry, designated by name to come to make David king. 18,000 of half a tribe. And then the second tribe it's talking about, it says, uh, of the sons of Ishkar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and All their brethren were at their command. Isn't that impressive? Next verse, 33. Of Zebulun, there was 50,000 who went out to battle. So everybody's putting out these huge numbers. But of the sons of Ishkar, how many? 200. Only 200, right? That's not much. But they have a special characteristic. What is it? They had understanding of the times, right? They were different, and all their brethren, says, were at their command. Who wants to be like that? Who wants to be like Daniel? Was Daniel maybe one of, was Daniel like this, these persons? Amen. He was one of the persons who knew, understood the times. Was he like David? We could read it in, in Daniel, uh, the first chapter of Daniel. He was um, a person of war. He was 
of good understanding, a very smart person, because God gave him all those blessings. Was God with him? Yes, he was. Amen. Um, and then came the writing on the wall. Back to our original story. Mene, mene, or mini, mini. Um, so on, when, when uh, Daniel translates this, he only translates mini once, which uh, mini means counted or numbered. I don't know why, but my understanding or what I got out of it is that he was probably counted or he was probably numbered twice. So he was given opportunity, right? Maybe he was counted once, and he was not, obviously not found fit. So they gave him another opportunity and he was counted again, right? It says uh, the, the Mahan actually wrote mini, mini. So he wrote mini twice. The translation, when Daniel comes over and translates it, he translated it as one single word. So I'm not an expert at um, Hebrew, but it could be that he was... Uh, done twice, right? He was a, a numbered twice. I'm gonna, I, I want to read you um, Patriot, Patriots and King, Prophets and Kings, sorry, 535. Every nation that has come upon the stage of the action has been permitted to occupy its place on the earth, that the fact might be determined whether it would fulfill the purpose of the watcher and the holy one. Prophecy has traced the rise and progress of the world's greatest empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. With each of these, as with the nations of less power, history has repeated itself. Each has had its period of test. Each has failed. Its glory faded. Its power departed. While nations have rejected God's principles and his rejection have throughout their own ruin, yet a divine, overruling purpose has manifest, manifestly been at work throughout the ages. Isn't this amazing? We as a nation, as individuals, we're being tested. We're being numbered. We're being watched to see if we accomplish the purpose that God has for us in this world. Amen? God will judge. The day of judgment is coming. Now, who, uh, in comparison, who did Belshazzar actually try to defy? Who was that person? Who was that hand? Who was that God? Um, I personally, like, um, I, 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 I believe me, don't get me wrong, I love Christmas and everything, but it seems like the images that we stay more, uh, the most in our mind with, uh, of Jesus is a baby or either crucified, right? They were worshiping the gods, the idols with those uh, vessels of wood, of brass, gold, silver, and sometimes we, we, we keep in our mind also that Jesus is, is a baby or, or the world can keep that in their mind, right? Because as Christianity present a lot of Christmas, we present it as a baby, right? I don't know here, but like um, in Mexico, everybody's Catholic. It's either a baby or it's either a person crucified, the image, and that's all that you could pull to your mind. When Daniel was there, he 
mentioned how Nebuchadnezzar had come and had been humiliated, had been become a beast, and how he was taught. He says, Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever, whoever who chooses. God is reigning. He is in heaven. In um, Isaiah 6, 1, it says that in uh, Isaiah writes that in the year the king, I remember the king's name. I could look it up real quick. Um, in the year the king died, he, is, he saw God in the throne. But why does he mention in the, in the year that he saw in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting in, on a throne. Why does he mention that? Because he was worried. That was a good king that had, had got, done good stuff for the Lord. He had advanced the worship of Israel to God, the real God. And now that king had died. And he was worried about it. But what did he see? He saw God. And he says, High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Doesn't matter who is a president. Doesn't matter who is ruling United Nations, who's the president of Russia, who's attacking who, who is in the throne. Doesn't matter if the king had done good work. Doesn't matter if he was a bad king. He was concerned. Who's going to reign now? What's going to happen? And he, then God showed him who was the true king. Who was the person sitting on the throne? Isn't that amazing? In Desire of Ages... It says, with uh, Jesus' ascension, as they drew near to the city, the challenge is given by the escorting angels. Lift your heads up, O gates, and be ye lift ye of everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Joyfully, the waiting sentinels respond, Who is the King of glory? This, they say this not because they do not know who, who he is, but because they would hear the answer of exalted praise. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Even lift them up. Yea, everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Again is heard the challenge. Who is the king of glory? For the angels never weary to hear, of hearing his name exalted. The extorting, escorting angels make reply. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Amen. Then the portals of the city of God are open wide and the angelic throne sweep through the gates amid a burst of rapturous music. Who is our king? Who do we worship? God. Is God a little baby? He is the king sitting on his throne. The king of glory. Amen? Now, we have this king looking at us, the unseen watcher. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we fail or we don't. He's always watching us. If you have been touched with this sermon this morning, if you want to, if you have done stuff like everybody else, like I have, done stuff that was not according to your beliefs, if 
the unseen watcher have seen you done stuff that are inappropriate, which we all have done, and you want to ask for forgiveness and rededicate your life to Jesus, this is almost the end of the year. It's time where we could start a new chapter. We could rededicate our lives to Jesus. Please stand up. It was just the fear. It's 11.59. We're good. <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for um, this, this sermon, Lord, not because of me, Lord, but we want to thank you. You know, I have no words to say. We want to thank you, Lord. We want to rededicate our lives. We want to write a new chapter. We want to ask you for forgiveness. We want to have the unseen watcher see us and that we could give glory to your name in all times. Thank you, Lord, for this year, for this Christmas, for the life, for family, for so many blessings, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.